Well, we are in part five of this series, Seven Reasons Why the, uh, the Atheist Might Be Right. And uh, today I want to talk to you about reason number five. That's week five in this. And uh, we have uh, people who attack the Christian faith and actually any, any faith at all, atheists, who don't believe in any kind of a deity, whether that be a monotheistic, meaning a single god or, or many gods, polytheistic or whatnot. Um, and uh, today, one of the, uh, I want to talk to you about one of the big reasons why they say this can't be so, that at least for the Christians, um, they say that the only evidence for Jesus and his life is, is found in the Bible. And outside of the Bible, uh, there, there is no evidence, or it's very much lacking. And so that's what we want to sort of tackle today. Now, uh, every child pretty much grows up believing in imaginary characters, whether it's a, um, some sort of a association with a holiday like Santa or maybe a cartoon character like Mickey, you'll find that kids generally have these imaginary friends or they, they make into uh, the, these characters in their minds and, and uh, they believe in them. In fact, uh, even superheroes kids believe in today, they, they don't know like Superman's not real. But you're okay with that as a mom or a dad, I guess, until they grow and their minds develop and they realize, oh, even though I may have seen Superman on the big screen, it's an act. You know, they're, they're acting. And of course, with all the technology, it looks real and everything. And so uh, we're okay with that. And we, we, we appreciate that development in kids. And yet, when, when we become adults, we, we begin to hopefully have put away those imaginary friends, right? And those fictional characters in, in our lives. And um, it, it, we would think that somebody who still believes in that, like, you know, like wrestling on TV, would be that they would know that's not really real. Uh, um, right, right. I had people who'd want to go toe to toe with me on that one, you know, but that's okay. Um, but we still, we, we think about people, adults maybe, who, who would have fictional characters in their, you know, they still have imaginary friends as being the least, you know, at least odd, if nothing more so than that. And so um, we come to this, this Jesus Christ, this Jesus of Nazareth, and, and we look at his life, and uh, maybe you might look at his life and go, you know, he existed or he, he didn't exist. Some people think he's a pretend mythological legend that really never existed. And so um, when you look at his life, though, you realize at least whether every Christian on this earth is deluded to some degree, deceived to some degree, or just they're playing pretend in their mind, this fictional character, Jesus, nonetheless, uh, Jesus of Nazareth has influenced uh, more people than any other human in all of the history of the world. I mean, incredibly so. To this day, more than 2 billion people claim to be his followers, to, to say that they believe in this one named Jesus. And that's more adherence than any other religion or any other worldview that's out there. More than 2 billion. Now, Christianity, that is because of Jesus, those who follow Christ, has, um, is responsible uh, for a disproportionately large number of humanitarian advances in the history of civilization. For instance, in education, in medicine, in law, in the arts, you'll find for human rights, uh, even in the natural sciences based on the belief that God designed the universe and, uh, and did so in an orderly fashion and left clues for people to learn about what he has done. Christianity has really advanced um, humankind in things concerning all those that I just mentioned. And yet there are claims against Jesus' life, against the existence of Jesus himself. An inordinate number of websites, uh, blogs, and bloggers make the claim that Jesus never really existed, that he's a legend, that there's this thing called the mythological Jesus, the mythical Jesus. The atheistic community on Facebook that I'm a part of, meaning I'm not an atheist, but that I enter into that lion's den on a regular basis, that community on Facebook that I dive into, they repeatedly, different, you know, it's like, you know, one Christian and 50 atheists um, here and there, they'll jump on and they'll say that Jesus never really lived, that he is a fictional character. Now, is this true? And so I have responded, but then you get, you know, 
a week later, you get a whole bunch more that say the same thing. They didn't read the other posts in the past. Now, some years ago, when Life Magazine did a cover story on the identity of Jesus, Life Magazine, um, they asked several people who they thought Jesus was. And John Murray, the founder of American Atheists, is quoted as saying this. There was no such person in the history of the world as Jesus Christ. There was no historical, living, breathing human being by that name ever. The Bible, he goes on to say, is a fictional, non-historical narrative. The myth is good for business, end quote. Hmm. In the 19th century, a German historian named Bruno Bauer claim that Jesus never existed, and although his arguments never took hold and never got any traction much, there was one of his students that was very much persuaded, and that guy's name was Karl Marx. Karl Marx became the founder of communism, and ever since then, denial, the denial of Jesus' existence has been a common belief among Marxists. In our own lifetime, a professor of German at the University of London named George Wells has claimed that Jesus never existed. Now listen to this. Claimed that Jesus never existed. Professor in London, right? And he's written a number of books arguing his claim to be true. He wrote his 1982 book, The Historical Evidence for Jesus, and his 1996 books, The Jesus Legend. Again, he's writing these things, and so then a host of atheists and atheistic websites or atheist websites on the internet cite George Wells, this professor, as having proved that Jesus never really existed. Hmm. Now, yet, on the other side, you've got the Britannica Encyclopedia who, that uses over 20,000 words to describe Jesus more than Aristotle, Cicero, more than Alexander the Great, more than Julius Caesar, more than Buddha, more than Confucius, more than Mohammed, and more than Napoleon. So there appears to be sufficient evidence for these writers to be convinced that Jesus of Nazareth actually lived. Dr. N.T. Wright, who is widely regarded as the leading Jesus historian in all of Europe, says, quote, it would be easier, frankly, to believe that Tiberius Caesar, Jesus' contemporary, was a figment of the imagination than to believe that there was never such a person as Jesus. Still, my friends, there are skeptics, doubters, agnostics, atheists, and the like who deny the existence of Jesus of Nazareth as having ever lived at all. And you ask the question, I ask the question, why? Why is that there. Why do some professors, some historians, some of those who um, do not believe, why do they claim, why do they say that Jesus never existed? And so you might be sitting here today and say, you know, I've heard that before. And, uh, you know, what I've read of them, I've read of them in the Bible. And yet the atheist then says, I don't believe the Bible, so don't use the Bible. Because it's circular reasoning. It's self-refuting if, in, say, if in, de, in, in truth the atheist or the agnostic says, I don't believe the Bible, so don't use the Bible, and you go on saying, well, the Bible says. Now, it's not that we should dismiss the Bible because it is historical. It is, there are ancient documents. In fact, there's 24,000 plus, actually about 27,000, uh, 54, 5,700 full um, manuscripts of the of the uh, Old and New Testaments, and then you've got fragments and pieces up to 27,000 and climbing all the time as they uh, get on these digs and these uh, uh, excavations and they find more. All right, so you've got a lot of evidence that there is, that the New Testament is credible, but what if you can't use the New Testament? And what about you? Where do you stand on this? Let's just say, somebody said, yeah, but there's no evidence. It's just a myth. It's just these four Gospels, you know, or the Bible. It writes about Jesus, but nowhere else. Where do you stand on that? What kind of evidence could you give? Well, today, I want to give you some of this evidence that's outside of Christianity, outside of the believing community, outside of the Gospels and the New Testament to talk about what history says about Jesus. All right, and the reason I'm standing here, by the way, again, is because we're out of lights over here, so that's why I'm kind of stuck right here, all right? Because we're, on, we're doing this on film, so just so you know. All right, so um, why then are there those who still say 
Jesus doesn't exist. Well, they claim that there's no real evidence, no valid evidence, or very little, if any, outside of the Gospels that match, that match his life as the Gospels portray. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So is that claim true? Uh, is it true, in fact, that we have no evidence outside of the Bible for the life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? So let's look. Let's take a look first at ancient non-Christian sources, because that's where I really want to land today. All right? Here it is. Ancient historians. The first that I want to talk to you about and the ancient historians. These are people who is a historian in ancient times. They wrote down things. These were historians back in the day, thousands of years ago. All right, And so you have the first one, Tacitus. Cornelius Tacitus lived between 55 and 120 A.D., was a Roman historian. He's not a believer. This isn't a guy who's like following Jesus. He lived through the reigns of over a half dozen Roman emperors. And the reason he lived so long, or that is he went through so many, is because many of these Roman emperors, emperors were assassinated, and usually by the Praetorian Guard who didn't like him, who were supposed to be his protectors. And so they didn't like him. They took him out. What are they going to do? You know, they're all in it together, okay? So, uh, so he's been called, Tacitus has been called the greatest historian of ancient Rome. And so he is a person that lists what uh, uh, um, evidence about Jesus and Christianity and the life of Christ. Now, what I want to say to you as I list all of these, I want to say to you that <clears throat> today or later when you... Uh, go home, let's say tomorrow, up on the website where you can get all my notes. You can get all these notes online. I just put it on there just like I've got it here. I'm going to add to this, um, on this document, all of exactly what they said. That is, I would bore you if I wrote, uh, read everything that they had to say because you're probably not looking for all those kinds of details unless you are. And if you are, they'll be on the website where you can go, okay, this is exactly what they said. But these people mention Jesus, the Christ. They mention his crucifixion. They mention things like that about Jesus of Nazareth. And these are people outside of the gospel narratives and even of the New Testament, okay? So Tacitus is one of them. Then uh, Suetonius is another. He is another Roman historian. He was the chief secretary of Emperor Hadrian, okay? And uh, you see his dates was uh, 117 to 138 AD, and he had access to imperial records. And he writes about Jesus, his followers, and Christianity and such. Then we have another ancient historian. This was Josephus. You've probably heard of his name. He was a Jewish historian who wasn't a follower of Jesus. And Flavius Joseph was born in 37 or 38 AD. He died in 97 AD. He was born into a priestly family and became a Pharisee at the age of 19. Pharisees typically did not follow Jesus. We know of one that did. His name was Nicodemus. We know that. But we didn't have any evidence of Josephus following Jesus, and yet he writes about him extensively in his histories. Also, you have Thallus. Thallus wrote in Greek an account of world history from the fall of Troy, which was mythological, uh, to then up to the mid-first century, and mentions Jesus' crucifixion and the darkness that covered the land at that time. So you've got Thallus. And then also, you've got these were historians. Now you've got government officials I want to talk to you about. These are all writings outside of Christianity. So if somebody says to you, there's no evidence outside of the New Testament for Jesus' life, they don't know what they're talking about. All they're doing is probably parroting, announcing, mirroring what somebody else has said. And so they don't have credible evidence if they deny these things because anybody can access this. All right, so government officials. Pliny the Younger is the first one. He was a Roman author and administrator who served as the governor of Bithynia. Also, another government official who wrote about Christians and Jesus and whatnot was Emperor Trajan. He was the Roman emperor from 98 to 117 AD. And he writes also and gives indication that, that this Jesus of Nazareth that there is reference to him and his life and his followers. 
Other sources, other Jewish sources, beyond government officials, would be the Talmud. The Talmud was, is a Hebrew word for study, and it's one of the central works of the Jewish people. Uh, it is the record of rabbinic, that is rabbi, rabbinic teachings that span a period of about 600 years beginning in the first century. This also mentions Jesus. Now, you've got to remember something about the Jews. Some believed on Jesus because actually his followers were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. So some did believe on him as being the Christ, but many did not. And the reason they did not was because they were looking for a different kind of Messiah, one that would deliver them from Roman rule, one that would free them from Roman bondage and dictatorship. And Jesus didn't come to do that. Jesus came not to free them of Rome, but to free them of themselves, to free Steve of his own sin, of his own heart, of his own self. Have you ever wanted to be free from yourself? I have. Have you ever wanted to be free? Well, Jesus came to do that. And the next time he comes, when he comes back, he will free us from stuff in this world, which will be cool too, right? That'll be cool too. But the first time he came, it was to free the hearts of mankind. See, Jesus didn't come to, and, and die to make you good. Said it before, said it again. He came to make you free. And oftentimes it's becoming free of who we are. You know, those things, those skeletons in the closet, those things that I can't overcome, those things, those habits, those, those choices that I make that I seem to fail and fall back into time and time and time again. But Jesus came to free Steve of his own ugliness, his own sin, his own wickedness. And that's why he came. And listen, it's good I'm a Christian. Because if you knew me way back, and I could say the same for you, and some of you are way worse than I would have ever been. It's good that I'm now following Jesus, because if I wasn't, I'd probably be dead or in jail. And hey, you don't have to amen that, but you know the truth is, <laughs> some of you would, never mind, you know, you understand, Jesus freed you from yourself. You got that? That's good to know. For those of you who aren't yet free from yourself and free from your own sinful ways or your own tendencies... Jesus can do that, and that's why he came to you. He says, who, he who knows the Son, and uh, he who comes to the Son, the Son will set free. And whoever is free is free indeed. You'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. Knowing the truth. Not just the truth, but knowing the truth. Jesus is the truth. Knowing him will set you free. He came to set people free. All right, the Jews rejected him, but they still wrote about him. It's pretty cool. This stuff is outside of Christian doctrine. All right? Then other Gentile sources. Gentile just means other than Jew. And then the first I want to mention to you that wrote about Jesus was uh, Lucian. He was a second century Greek sat, uh, sat satirist. Uh, how do you say that? Is that right? You said it, all right? And uh, Lucian spoke rather cynically of Jesus and the early Christians, but he still wrote about them. And then Marabar Serapion, he, in a British museum, he, um, a remarkable letter from Mara. Serapion to his son, written in 70 AD, shortly after Jerusalem was destroyed, refers to the death of Socrates, Pythagoras, and Jesus. And so you've got these. And then, then you have these. Then you have the Gnostic sources. Now, Gnostic, uh, Gnosticism is a word we get the English word knowledge from. Gnosticism was supposedly a super knowledge, a knowledge that only some got and others didn't. And so they were, this was like a sect. And they said, that's a S-E-C-T, a sect that said, you know, we've got knowledge you can't get. We're better than you, that kind of thing. And so what they did was they said, you know, we, we've got this insight knowledge to things in the world, and they would write about Jesus and whatnot, though they didn't match the Gospels, they didn't match the New Testament, they were rejected as being part of the New Testament. They still wrote about Jesus, dozens and dozens and dozens of writings about Jesus in the Gnostic realm. You have like the Book of Thomas and the Book of the Gospel of Thomas and the Book of Mary, and, and the, uh, then you've got the Apocrypha and all of these different things and the Pseudo-Apocrypha and all these ancient, um, some Gnostic writings or many Gnostic writings referred to Jesus in so many ways and his followers. And yet, though the writings are not credible as being scripture, they're still writings, and they affirm the fact that Jesus, the Nazarene, lived and was not a myth, legend, or fictitious. And so we've got those sources. And so you would think um, that here in this room, you would think, and those of you watching, that as much as we have heard about Jesus in the Western world, 
in the United States primarily and in Europe or, uh, you know, England. As much as we've heard about Jesus over the years in our lives and in the past, that there would be truckloads of information about him and life uh, beyond the Bible. Uh, but not so. There's not truckloads of information about Jesus and his life beyond the Bible. We would think there would be, just, and that's normal, because all your life you've seen movies about Jesus. You, you've been indoctrinated by the Bible, and there's just, doesn't everybody know the Bible? And, and isn't there a whole lot of information out there beyond the Bible to say that Jesus existed? There's plenty of information, but there's not dump load, truckloads of information about Jesus and you say, well, well, why? Because I, I thought there was. Why wouldn't there be? And so I want to help you understand why there's not truckloads and why people still doubt, even though there's this information and many people don't know all that information and what they said about Jesus. They don't, understand, they don't know this. And so they're ignorant of it, unaware of it. And so they say, Jesus never existed. It's just an easy ploy to hide behind the website, the blogs, and all this stuff because you can hide yourself. If I stand with somebody or sit with somebody at a Starbucks, let's say, and I'm talking to them about Jesus, and they say, Jesus never existed, and I pull this stuff out, they can't hide any longer. But it's easy to hide on a website or behind a website or behind a Facebook post or whatever. You can't really get to them. They're over there, and you can't confront them. And you can't, you know, you can only shout them down if you want to on, online, but, you know, you've got arguments going back and forth, and so nobody actually becomes really credible there. Does that make sense to you? So when you're sitting face-to-face -face with somebody and you bring these things up, it's like, what do you do with that? And what do you do with this? And what do you do with that? And they go, yeah, 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 that's all, folks. I don't know. You know. All right, so why the scant evidence for Jesus outside of the Bible? Scant, not in the sense that I, I just listed some of those. And there, there's, there's plenty. There's actually 39 sources outside of Christianity, outside of the New Testament that refer to Jesus, his followers, the crucifixion, and whatnot. There's, there's at least 39 sources that we know of. That's a good amount. But you'd say, well, Steve, how come there's like, like hun not hundreds and hundreds and hundreds? Let me tell you why. <clears throat> Let me read to you what one historian wrote regarding the evidence. This is really intriguing because I had this question. I wonder, I even wrote to uh, William Craig Lane, who is a well-known historian, theologian, philosopher about this same question. And so let me read to you what one historian wrote regarding this. They actually wrote me back, but let me tell you what <clears throat> somebody wrote regarding this seeming scant evidence. And it is sort of scant, <clears throat> excuse me, in a way, compared to all the evidence we'd have today to you know, with all the things that are available to us. I mean, the technology is incredible today. All right, so this historian writes, some may complain that it seems like, rather, like a rather sparse amount of information. On the other hand, until the last few centuries, history and biography in general almost exclusively focused on the exploits of kings and queens or their cultural equivalents, military conquests, and defeats, people in official institutional positions of power in a given society, and the wealthy more generally, not the least because it was primarily these people who could read and or afford to own written documents. Jesus qualified for attention under none of these headings. Moreover, no non-Christians in the first several centuries of the common era had any reason to imagine that his influence would grow and spread the way it did in the millennium and a half ahead. So he goes on to say, so it is arguable that it is actually rather impressive that as much has been preserved outside of Christian circles as has been. And of course, most ancient testimony to uh, any person or event has been lost over the centuries so that many other references to Jesus might have existed, that might have existed, that we simply no longer know about, end quote. So what I want to show you, you say, well, you know, how, this is really cool. You know, how, um, how influential 
was Israel at the time of the Roman occupation. Now, this is really, I'm going to show you a map here in just a second on the screen, but check this out. Before we show you that, I want you to, I want you to understand something. You look at this and you think, because again, we see these movies and, and, and we, we don't really hear about, uh, we hear about Rome, but we hear, uh, you know, about, you know, we see the Roman stuff on TV and movies and what, and the conquests of maybe some Greece things, but and then, then you hear a lot about you know, Israel and, and the fighting and, and the, the Roman occupation there and Jesus' day and all that. But you don't hear about anywhere else really in the world much. And so we think it's like big, big, and big. You know, like Palestine, G- Israel, you know, Jerusalem and all that. Big time deal back then. But here's what I want you to see. The Roman Empire in the time of Jesus actually occupied about the uh, amount of square miles as the United States, the 48 contiguous states, does. And I want to show you this map here. Let's bring this up. And the outline of the red is where Rome actually ruled during that time. Now, you see the, the boot there. That's, that's Italy. And then the little white dot over there in the center of the screen, upper middle, is, is Rome. And Rome, okay, ruled all of this. But way over here in this spot here to the bottom right, see that little white spot there? I made that about a thousand times bigger than it should have been. That's Jerusalem. How important do you think that that was to those guys who lived way over there about 1,500 miles as the crow flies one way? Not very much. In other words, Israel, Palestine, Judea, all of this was barely anything. It was like an just an out, you know, just don't bother me kind of place. You know, kind of, we, you know, we got you, but, you know, just, you're not that important. So why would any Roman historian or person of any sort write about what's going on there when they got all of that to deal with? And all the uprisings and all the fights and all the battles that are taking place all over the rest of the known world. It's a good question, isn't it? Now, while you're looking at that, let me read to you what another scholar, Dr. Jeffrey Cola, says regarding this that you see on the screen. He says, quote, In the first century, Judea was a backwater Roman province. That's over here. Nothing important happened there. They sent minor officials to govern it. It really had not much consequence in the Roman Empire. And really, and no one really knew how uh, much of what was going on in Judea. They tried to just keep it quiet. So to have any evidence of any historical figure is quite striking. In fact, it was only recently that we had external evidence of Pontius Pilate himself. And we uh, now know that he actually existed in the dates of his rule and things like this. So when there's a claim that, well, we don't have any evidence of Jesus, it's actually kind of what we would expect. On the other hand, we do have rather significant textual evidence of references to Jesus pretty early on and from non-Christian, non-Jewish sources, end quote. Makes a lot of sense now, doesn't it? We can bring that back down. We don't have to keep that up. Also, some other historian wrote that um, about the matter of the sparse evidence uh, outside of the Gospels for Jesus. This, another historian wrote, quote, It is also important to recognize that in A.D. 70, that is, Jesus died around A.D. 30. A.D. 70, 40 years later, the Romans invaded and destroyed, I'm quoting now, invaded and destroyed Jerusalem and most of Israel, slaughtering its inhabitants. Entire cities were literally burned to the ground. We should not be surprised then if much evidence of Jesus' existence was destroyed. Now, so you look at all that and you go, okay, now that begins to make a lot more sense. Okay, Now I want to throw something out at you. Did you know that President... Abraham Lincoln was an agnostic until the age of 40. And here's why he was an agnostic. He was an agnostic because he looked at the evidence of Jesus outside of the New Testament and couldn't find much until he read a book, he, until he went on a quest. And he said, it says, quote, <clears throat> um, 
so he, he it says, he examined the evidence and became convinced of the truth about Jesus and put his faith and trust in Jesus as his Savior. And Lincoln wrote, quote, my doubts scattered to the winds and my reason became convinced by the arguments and support of the inspired and infallible authority of the Old and New Testaments, end quote. Because he looked at the evidence. Somebody back then actually had a book that he began to look at, oh, here's some evidence. Oh, here's some evidence of his life, Jesus' life outside of the New Testament doctrines of Scripture. So here today, you, you in this room and those of you watching have been given some evidence for the life of Jesus Christ. And now the ball's sort of been bounced into your court. You got to answer the question, what are you going to do with that ball, the evidence that Jesus had lived? And his existence is real because it's in your hands. What are you going to do with that? Um, how are you going to decide at this point? For you, um, it is a matter of deciding if you haven't already. Meaning if you've if chose, well, I'm not going to decide. That's sort of a decision, isn't it? Um, Jesus, I'm going to wrap up with this. Jesus asked an overarching question while he walked the earth. And, and here's the overarching question that Jesus asked. Um, <clears throat> he asked this to those who were following him, but they were not all in yet. And uh, Josh, come on up, and thanks. Get ready for your guitar. I appreciate it. Uh, and Jesus asked this question, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I, the son of man, he called himself, which is a reference to the book of Daniel, when Daniel talked about the son of man equaling God. Who do you say that I I'm God. Who do you say that I am? I say I'm God. Who do you say I am? And here's the account. It's found, as we close, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. It says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his people, who do, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, the reason he asked this is because he deliberately, listen to this, he deliberately went to Caesarea Philippi, and this was the place where uh, there was a great edifice out of white stone, white limestone, that you could see on a hill that was built to the Caesar. It was a monument of monumental size. and Everybody could see it. It was glistening in the sun, white. And, and basically he was saying, people call Caesar Lord. That's where he stays. Caesarea Caesar Philippi. Caesarea Philippi. Jesus comes to Caesarea Philippi. The place of Philip, where he had it was built in honor to this Caesar. Okay, and so he goes there and he says, "This is um, what the Roman world says as God." They called him Kurios, Caesar, Kurios, which means Lord. It's the Greek word for Lord. They had to bow down, and then there were many other shrines in the region of Caesarea Philippi. And yet the Bible says in the book of Mark that Jesus took his disciples and walked up and down the streets and through the city. And I could just imagine Jesus pointing out all these different shrines to these different false gods. And Jesus gets his boys out of the city with the city behind him. I could just see him sitting down on a rock and these guys are kind of sitting over here and he begins to talk and teach. And then he says with the city behind him, who do you say that I, the son of man, is? They say that Caesar is Lord. Others say that these people are Lord. But who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Pretty probing question. Verse 14. And they said, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, a great prophet in the Old Testament. Or Jeremiah, another great prophet. Or one of the other lesser prophets. But Jesus said, but you, Jesus asked them, who do you, not them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter spoke up. This is Peter. He answered, you are the Messiah. In other words, you're the Christ. You're the anointed one. You're the forgiver, the redeemer of mankind. You're the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. The living God, not the false gods, not the dead gods, the living God. Jesus responded, Simon, sign of Jonah, son of Jonah, that's your dad. Simon, Peter, you are blessed. You know why you're blessed? Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father 
who is in heaven revealed it to you. In other words, you got the inside scoop. You found out what was really going on. Because God, my Father, showed this to you. That I am the Christ. I am the Redeemer. I am the Messiah of Israel and of the world. I'm the one and the only one who can forgive sins. I'm the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said these things. Peter got it. So I want to ask you a question. Could this be you today? When the question is probed to you, who do you say that Jesus is? Could this be you where God is right now? You're sitting there in your seat or, or, and God speaks to you and says, Jesus is the Christ. He is the one. You've heard him about your whole life. You've sort of rejected him. You've kind of thrust him from you. Or maybe you've been sitting on the fence just not sure or certain. You had too many doubts, but today God's revealed that Jesus is the Christ to you in your own heart. It's not flesh and blood. Steve didn't reveal it to you. He gave you some information. But what's speaking inside of your heart right now, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is talking to you. And I wonder if this could be you. Could it be that heaven is revealing to you right now that Jesus is who he said he was? That he is the forgiver, yours, your forgiver? That he will truly set you free of yourself, of your own sin, and forgive you of all your sin and then make a way for you because of him and the payment of the cross, his death on the cross, his sacrificial atonement on the cross, to pay for your sins? Listen, every one of us is headed for death. Everybody in this room, we're all going to die. And one day when you do, the Bible says, Jesus said, you will stand before God. And you will have to stand before him either cleansed of your sins or still full of your sins. Remember, my friends, good people don't go to heaven. And bad people don't go to hell. Forgiven people go to heaven. And non-forgiven people go to hell. This is what Jesus said. Now, if you're sitting there today and you want forgiveness, we're going to give you an opportunity here to receive Christ today. Would you bow your heads with me right now? No one moving around, please. Would you just bow your heads in, in honor of God right now? I want to say to you, that right now inside of your heart, it's kind of like shaking a little bit maybe. Maybe it's kind of like you just feel something on the inside. You just sense something. You sense that. Well, maybe that's the Spirit of God drawing you to Him. Isn't it enough that you're that you just choose? I'm, I'm not going to do the playing the church thing anymore. I'm going to. I'm not going to play the religion card. I, I'm not going to play the good card anymore. I'm going to play the forgiven card through Jesus. I'm going to receive him today. I'm going to put my faith and trust in him. And if that's you today, I want to invite you to say yes to him and pray this prayer with me, would you? If you're ready to pray a prayer to receive Christ, we want you to pray this with me right now, but make this your personal prayer. Just whisper this under your breath because I don't really want you talking to me or to others or surround you. I want you to kind of like go vertical with your talk right now to God and say this. Say, Dear God, as best as I know how, let's go ahead and just whisper that to him, as best as I know how, I come to you as a sinner, as a person who needs forgiveness, and I ask you to cleanse me through the atoning work of Jesus. Today, I put my trust, my faith in Jesus alone for my eternal life, for the forgiveness of my sins. And I thank you for giving me faith to believe today. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.